Good morning. It is 10 a.m. Central Standard Time, uh, 4 21 Here at Seagullville, Texas, the weather is beautiful outside. I hope yours is the same. We want to say a special welcome to the Solar Prep for Girls, Arcadia Park IS, Dallas ISD, and Frank Dallas ISD, and Cesar Chavez Dallas ISD. Thank you so much for joining in us. And we wish you could be here in person, but that will come soon. Teachers, if you're watching and you have not signed up, please do so. Go to www.towny.cc slash EEC register and sign up. That's just for our attendance records. Today, we're gonna to do changes in the food chain. Uh, during this virtual field trip, students will investigate the flow of energy in a food chain and predict how changes in a food chain affect the ecosystem. Students will also investigate environmental changes such as floods and droughts where some organisms thrive and others perish or move to new location. Ms. Nash will discuss removal of bees. Mr. Monroe will talk about the removal of frogs. Ms. Fuller will cover floods and Ms. Ramirez We'll talk to you about droughts. Uh, you cannot ask us a verbal question, but you can go to www.towny.cc slash EEC space question space answer and send in your questions. I'll do my best to answer them during the program. If not, I will answer them and send the answers to your teachers and they can discuss them uh, with, with you. Now I'm going to share my screen. No, I'm going to actually stop sharing my screen. And Mrs. Nash is going to talk to you about bees. Welcome to my classroom. Today we're going to be talking about bees and other pollinators and how important they are to all life on the planet, including us. Okay. So if we didn't have bees, we would not have much food to eat. And the plants themselves would not be able to make seeds and therefore there would be eventually you no know, more plants some, in some cases. So let's look at some pictures of interesting pollination resources or connections. So one of the big insights from studying life on our planet is that everything is connected and we are connected to life on the planet. And our food chain starts with plants. And in fact, 75%, three quarters of the crops that people eat all around the world depend on pollinators, mostly bees. So all these yummy foods up here that we love to eat, okay, they, they depend on bees for pollination. Here's just a list of a few of the many, many crops from alfalfa to watermelon, from apples to watermelon that need bees for pollination. And in some cases, they're really specific and what we call obligate relationships. In other words, only one animal pollinates that plant. Without that animal, that plant would not get pollinated. And then eventually that plant would not be there. So this is a really cool bird over here with that weird, weird beak. Look at that beak. And then look at this flower. Just the same shape. So that beak goes in to get the pollen. I mean, the nectar at the bottom. And in the meantime, that pollen right here gets deposited on the bird's head and it goes to the next flower and pollinates it. And then the plant can make seeds. Here's another weird partnership with a long nosed fly. Okay, and this little orchid here. And then our friend that we have around here is a hummingbird and our own beautiful red coral honeysuckle. See how the pollen is out here? Okay, so when the bird sticks a beak down in that pollen, gets stuck on their head and they go to the next flower. Another connection between a really common plant around in gardens around town, maybe even in your school garden if you have one, or a park around town, would be the Turk's cap. It's this really interesting flower that's closed up, furled up, 
and the the pollen is right here. The stigma is right here. So when the hummingbird sticks its beak down in, like on the picture, the pollen gets stuck on their head and they go to the next flower to pollinate it. A butterfly can get the nectar out of that flower, but they don't do any pollination. And why do we care about the pollination of the turkey's cap? Well, the mockingbird cares because after being pollinated, it will make this little fruit inside of the seeds. The mockingbird will eat that fruit and then in the mockingbird's droppings, it will plant seeds all around the garden. Okay, and there'll be more, more turkey's cap coming up everywhere in your garden. Other animals that also like the fruit include other birds like the, the blue jay, or birds or animals like the possum or the raccoon. So it's a really important relationship. And it starts with plants, but it moves on through that food chain. A fascinating example of connection between pollinators and plants is the, is the yucca. So the giant kind of yucca called the, the Joshua tree that grows out in the deserts of the American Southwest. Here's a big flower. And this plant is pollinated by one animal, one animal only, the yucca moth. The yucca moth also depends on the plant because it lays its eggs in the flowers and the larvae eat the seeds. Okay, not all the seeds, but some. So they depend on each other. And who depends on yucca moths for food? A bat. Okay, so moths fly at night. Who's a nighttime predator of insects? A bat. So again, all these interesting connections, one to the other. And I can see in my own neighborhood that connection between plants and animals and what happens when we do the wrong thing. So we have a native yucca, much smaller than that Joshua tree that grows around here. And where I live near White Rock Lake, there used to be a big field that was full of the yucca. But then they started mowing that field. They send those big tractors out and they'd mow it all down year after year after year after year. And the plants never got to flower anymore. Then they stopped mowing and the plants were still there. They kind of hung on, I don't know how really, but the, the plants themselves, the green part, the leaves had survived. So now they could flower. So they flowered, but now they never make seeds anymore because in the meantime, in the years when they were cut down, before they could flower, the yucca moths had all disappeared. And so the plant flowers now, but it never sets any seeds. So eventually that population of yuccas will disappear because they won't be able to make any seeds. So we need to remember that some plants are really dependent on one single pollinator. Another animal that's very dependent on one kind of plant is our friend, the, the, the monarch butterfly. It's coming back now from Michoacan. They spend the, spend the winter in Michoacan and they're coming back north now and you can probably see some if you go out to the park or the garden. And they are laying eggs right now. But they have to find one special plant to lay their eggs on, just one, the milkweed. So without the milkweed, there'd be no more monarch butterflies. And those butterflies are beautiful and we like to see them and they pollinate some plants but they also are part of that food chain. So here's a big argiope, that big beautiful garden spider has caught a monarch in her web. Okay, so everything is connected to everything else. Okay, so we need to remember that everything in nature, in our world really is connected to everything else. And we need to preserve all the parts of that really amazing amazing system. And I'd like to encourage you in the spring right now, really a great time of year to go out and do some observation, particularly of the connections between plants. We know they start that food chain and insects are often the first link in that chain that can go all the way up to us. So you can take your hand lens out to the garden or the park and start looking, start looking for examples of pollinators, okay, using the plants for nectar and also pollinating. So the insects are coming for nectar, but in the process they're getting pollen and then they're helping the plants make seeds. So it's a really interesting, interesting thing to, to learn about and enjoy the beauty of nature.
Thank you. If you have any questions, you can ask Dr. Corbin. Thank you, Ms. Nash. And the question was, what would happen if all the bees were eliminated? And Ms. Nash just really emphasized connection on that. So I want you to listen to this. Uh, we may lose all the plants that bees pollinate, all of the animals that eat those plants, and so on up the food chain. And we're at the top of the food chain, don't forget. Which means a world without bees could struggle to sustain the global human population of 7 billion people. Our supermarkets would have half of the fruit and vegetables, and it even gets worse than that. Thank you so much. And now we're gonna let Mr. Monroe tell you about what happened if we remove the frog. Good morning, students. My name is Mr. Monroe, and we're going to investigate what would happen if there was a removal of frogs from the world that we live in today? Well, let's talk about frogs. You know, a lot of people have mixed feelings about frogs. In fact, some people would probably feel, oh, we would be better off if we didn't have frogs around. There's a fear about frogs because I guess to some people, they're not very pleasant looking. Uh, there's some uh, I guess some falsehoods that are told about frogs saying that, uh, well, if you hold a frog or you touch a frog, you might get warts. Well, that's not true. If you get a wart, it's because the virus that causes the wart is already in the location, maybe in your, on your skin or wherever that wart may appear. Also, people don't like a lot of the noises that the frogs make. Well, animals make noises for reasons, and we'll get into that a little later on. But frogs, very important. Actually, frogs are a member of a large group of animals that are called amphibians, the amphibian family. And they're fur they are actually found all over the world, okay? Right here in Texas, as far as amphibians are concerned, there are 63 different species of amphibians found here in Texas. 40 Two of those 63 species actually are frogs and toads. So we have a lot of different kinds of frogs right here in Texas. In fact, there are a lot of different frogs found all over the world, especially there are some interesting ones found in the rainforest. Now, let's talk about the life of a frog. You know, frogs are very interesting because of their life cycle. They go through a life cycle of Tremendous change. One of the characteristics of living things is that they grow. Now you would think that that means they get bigger, but that's not true about frogs. I guess in a sense it would be, but they actually change in body structure. Amphibians are organisms or animals that live part of their life in water and part of their life on land. So that's what a frog does. A frog simply starts out as an egg. And usually the eggs are laid in a cluster. When those eggs hatch, they become tadpoles. Now, while they're in the water, they are very vulnerable for actual, uh, to actual influences of the environment ending their lives. Now, I have a couple of tadpoles that actually have hatched from some eggs. Hopefully you guys can see this. In the bottom of this beaker, that's a tadpole. Has a long tail, and you can see it is submerged in the water, so it's probably breathing like a fish would breathe. A little further along in the development of that tadpole, as it develops into a frog, we see that it starts growing legs. And if I can get this little fella to move around, you will see that this one actually has four legs. And it won't be long before the tail of this little tadpole is going to fall off or disappear and it will become a frog. And then once it becomes a frog, I will tell you the two well-known species of frogs that we have around our pond is the American bullfrog and the leopard frog. Well, I've got a friend down here I wanna show you. This is a full grown American bullfrog. 
This is Hoppy. Now you see I'm holding Hoppy with my hand. I am not going to get any warts, okay? Now Hoppy is an American bullfrog. He is an adult. He's quite large. He's been eating pretty good. So let's talk about how bullfrogs and leopard frogs in our pond fit in and why they're important to that ecosystem. Now, when we talk about an ecosystem, we're talking about all the living things are all living organisms in a certain area, as well as their physical environment, the things that surround them and that they live in, okay, their habitat. Now, frogs are very important to an ecosystem. One reason is that they eat insects and small animals. And other animals that live in that ecosystem, guess what? They eat them. And now that's a description of how food, animals consuming each other, is a transfer of energy. Now, frogs basically start out. Now, these tadpoles, when they're born in our pond, their primary diet is the algae that lives in our pond. They will eat algae. But as they grow older, instead of eating plant life, they start eating other things. They become carnivores. Frogs eat insects snails, spiders, worms, and even tiny fish. They also eat other aquatic and terrestrial animals. Now, it is said, just like Hoppy I showed you, that guy can eat his body weight in insects in one day. Now, if you look at the world population of living things in our world today, guess what? Insects outnumber any other living thing. And we have mixed feelings about insects too. Ms. Nash talked to, talk to you about uh, the importance of insects, but we have an abundance of them. And what keeps insects under control, guess what? Are animals like frogs. And if the frogs disappear, guess what? We're gonna have more insects. Now they're more important than that. You know, there are a lot of frogs all over the world today. And there are some frogs in, in the rainforest that scientists have actually found out that they not only eat insects, but there's a benefit, a medicine benefit to humans because some of the, the secretions and toxins that some of those frogs have, they have researched to find that they can be medicines to help heal humans. So that's another important thing, all right? Also, they are indicators of environmental health. It is said that when you find frogs around a pond or swimming in a pond, especially bullfrogs, that that pond, the water in that pond is very healthy. You see, frogs also breathe oxygen through their skin. Now their skin is permeable. That means it can absorb the oxygen through the skin. It can be pulled through. And so along with that oxygen being pulled through, <clears throat> a concentrate of toxic, toxins can enter. And so that's why they're saying any environmental change in that pond or lake, wherever the frogs are, uh, are residing, anything that's toxic that enters that frog is going to eliminate that frog from that environment. And that indicates that there's something, there's some kind of chemical imbalance in that body of water. Also, they play a role in our culture, too. How about Kermit the Frog? You guys are familiar with him, right? Why did they pick a frog and give him the name Kermit? Because he gets everybody's attention. But also, uh, a lot of the fairy tales that are told from long ago that involve princesses and prince. It is said that in some of those fairy tales, and I can't remember the exact details of one, but it was stated that if this princess kiss this frog, it would turn the frog into a prince. Isn't that something? We use them in our culture. Now, we are losing a lot of our frogs. In fact, I'll tell you, we've only seen one instance out here since I've been teaching out here, and I've been out here for a very long time, where our ponds have had an abundance of bullfrogs around because our ponds are constantly going through changes, drying up one year, then getting uh, rainfall to fill them back up and drying up another year. And so the frogs cannot sustain that. So something 
else is happening to our frogs. And I want to tell you what is actually happening. First of all, these things affect the population of frogs and amphibians in our state. Habitat loss, you know, we have more and more people living in the state of Texas than before. They've got to have places to live. So a lot of times ponds are filled in and houses are built in the area and that destroys a lot of the habitat that frogs need. Habitat fragmentation, all oh, building of roads and filling in ponds and maybe cutting some of those ponds into smaller sizes. The frogs, of course, when they lose that pond, they can move to another pond, right? Well, in the movement, it stresses those frogs. And a lot of times when it's time for the female frogs to lay eggs, they're trying to move to a safer and healthier place. And so they don't get to lay eggs. If they don't lay eggs, then we don't have any more our new tadpoles, do we? And then there's pollution. You know, people spray crops and they, they try to kill out different organisms that are maybe stopping them from growing certain, certain things. And then when it rains, we get precipitation. The runoff carries that toxin or that poison into ponds and lakes. And that also has an effect on the frog population because it will affect probably the reproduction of frogs by affecting the males where they cannot help in the process of reproduction. And then there's diseases like funguses. You know, there are a lot of people that are concerned about what's happening to our amphibians. You know, over half of the amphibians in the world today of those species is showing a decline in their population simply because of changes that are going on. In fact, the people that have become conscious of that way back in, well, not way back, but in the year 2017, they established a very special day, April the 29th, and they declared it Save the Frog Day. So there is concern about saving our frogs because they are very, very important to us. Now, at this point, I've run out of time and I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Gorman and maybe if you guys have got some questions, he can answer those for you. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. And the question came in. Uh, Mr. Monroe covered a lot of this, but it says, why are the frog numbers declining? Okay. Many of the causes of amphibian declines are well understood and appear to affect other groups of organisms as well as amphibians. These causes include habitat modification and fragmentation, introduced predators or competitors, introduced species, pollution, pesticide use, and over harvesting. Thank you again, Mr. Monroe. And now get your raincoats out because Ms. Fuller is going to tell you all about floods. Good morning, boys and girls. We are going to talk about flooding. So let me go ahead and share my screen with you and we'll get right on this. Floods. Now, how do floods affect food chains? Now, what is flooding? Flooding is the temporary overflow of water onto land that is normally dry. Now, what can cause flooding? Things like rain, snow, uh, coastal storms, storm surges, broken levees, broken dams. There are many things, both man-made and naturally caused, that can cause floods. Well, how do they affect us? How do they affect the food chain? So let's look at some essential questions. How do floods affect animals? And can people prevent floods? Well, right here we have a dragonfly on the left. Never kill a dragonfly. Dragonflies eat lots and lots of mosquitoes. So we want lots and lots of dragonflies. In the center is a Texas animal called an ocelot. We only have about 125 of them left. And they live in very dry regions, which would be devastated if they got flooded. And over on the right is a picture of what a flood looks like. Now, an animal that is positively benefited by flooding are alligator gar. This is an ancient fish that we have here in Texas. 
They've got long skinny faces like an alligator and lots and lots of sharp teeth like an alligator and great big scales, but they're not reptiles, they're fish. And how they reproduce, they lay their eggs on floodplains that have flood waters on them. And the flood waters will stand on those floodplains for a few days, giving the eggs time to hatch and for the little baby gar to grow a few days without threat of predators. So in this case, a flood would be a good thing for our ancient alligator gar friend. Some ranching and farm animals can be hurt by floods because they can be washed away. A lot of farm animals are not good at swimming. Uh, they may have to stand in polluted water for a long time. You, here you see a, a picture of some ranchers trying to use fencing to encourage the cattle that are stuck in the flood waters to move to higher land. Now floods can disrupt the food chain by causing predators to feed at lower trophic levels. For example, in the middle, there's a little predator called a coyote. He's a member of the dog family and he likes to eat things like rabbits and squirrels and persimmons. He doesn't just eat meat, he's an omnivore. But during a time of flood, he may not be able to find, much less catch some of these small mammals. So he may have to resort to eating things like crayfish or frogs, something way down on the uh, energy pyramid. Now on the left hand, oh, excuse me, the right hand side, you see a picture of a snake. We had an incident here at the environmental center several winters ago, and uh, we had a flood during the winter when the snakes were hibernating. And they, we find several uh, snake holes around our two ponds where the snakes hide and the holes filled with water, rainwater. Uh, and then of course the ponds flooded. So they were completely full. The snakes were asleep. They were hibernating and they drowned. So that's a, a negative aspect of the, uh, on the food chain because snakes not only are predators, they, uh, they're also a uh, favorite prey of a lot of animals, including the coyote. They like to eat snakes and snakes like to eat snakes. So they're a real important part of the ecosystem. Now, uh, one aspect of this predator business of them uh, uh, adapting very quickly to eating lower uh, on the trophic levels, um, uh, this could be a key mechanism uh, in sustaining biodiversity uh, within an ecosystem. So it seems like a really bad thing initially, but it can improve the biodiversity in an ecosystem. Now, wetlands absorb floodwaters. It's very important that we conserve our wetlands, that we keep them safe. They do tremendous amount of work for us. They filter poisons and pesticides and metals out of water. Uh, they can break things down in the soil because the soil is full of bacteria. Uh, they just do tremendous work. And especially uh, if you're gonna have a big storm like a hurricane, they can absorb a lot of the, the extra water. Now in the United States, we've not respected our uh, wetlands very much and we've drained a lot of them and that's not good. Another name for wetland would be marsh or swamp or fin or pocosin. We've got lots of names for them, but uh, it's important that we allow them to flourish. And the US postal system has a way you can contribute to the conservation of wetlands by buying a duck stamp. The, almost the entire cost of the duck stamp goes to the preservation of uh, places where uh, migratory waterfowl would be, would be uh, nesting and uh, using, and that would be wetlands. Okay, now beavers can build dams and this can slow water movement down and we can protect their dams. And the humans build dams also and levees and we can make sure to inspect the dams annually and also to repair any damages. 
And this is what happened to uh, New Orleans at the uh, Hurricane Katrina. They had some levees that they fully expected to hold the water back from the hurricane. And the, they had some damage and they broke and they flooded New Orleans. And this is what it looked like. So we had two problems. We had a lot of buildings on floodplains. Uh, New Orleans itself is uh, at a very low sea level. Uh, and then we also had these levees that failed. And the combination of those two was devastating to the community and also to the ecosystem. Now floods can be beneficial to some animals but harmful from others. People can use common sense to be good stewards of our natural environment. So uh, if you have the opportunity to um, be involved either in scouting or uh, when you grow up in uh, to be a park ranger, just keep in mind the environment is dependent upon uh, stewards of the land uh, taking good care and making sure that flooding doesn't have negative effects on the environment. Thank you so much. If you have any questions about, um, uh, about flooding, how it affects the environment, how it affects, affects people, uh, Dr. Gorman will be happy to answer those. Thank you. Tell us some of the positive effects of floods, student asked. Uh, number one, it renews the wetlands, it re it recharges, put water back into the wetlands. It returns nutrients to the soil. Uh, it prevents erosion and maintains land mass, keeps it from eroding, and it recharges the groundwater. So there are some benefits to floods. Most of them are not so good. And now Ms. Ramirez is going to tell you about droughts. Hello, my name is Mr. Ramirez, and in this segment, we're going to be learning about droughts. And drought is just simply when an area receives uh, less rainfall than normal, causing that area to be rather dry and hot. So I have a couple of things I'm going to show you guys um, that I found as a result of one of our ponds drying up. And here is a carp skeleton. So you can see the fish scales. You can see that big eye socket and then that big mouth of the carp. I also have another skeleton that's more bones <laughs> and doesn't really have the scales to it. Uh, but there were literally dozens of these fish skeletons left behind in our pond that dried up. And then another thing that I have here is a tumbleweed that I got in West Texas. And they also have drought right now. And a tumbleweed is a type of plant. Usually it's a Russian thistle. And when it gets really hot and dry, the plant ends up dying. It breaks off from its root and then the winds can just carry it away. Uh, so it's rather interesting if you've ever been to West Texas and you start to see all these tumbleweeds just rolling around all over the place. Uh, and again, those are more prevalent during times of drought. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you guys and we'll take a look um, at some other examples and causes of drought. And I have two essential questions for you guys. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to answer them. The first question is, what is drought? And the second question is, how does drought change environments and affect organisms? So think about how drought might um, impact a food chain as well. So here's some example of the tumbleweeds uh, that you saw earlier, and here's the wind blowing them across the street. Um, other examples of dust storms, especially common in the Texas panhandle because it's so dry and hot. Uh, so those are some uh, interesting effects of drought as well. And again, we know that drought is simply a period of drier than normal conditions that results in water related problems. So I'm going to show you guys a quick little video of some effects of drought here at the Environmental Center and, and um, in nearby locations. Uh, so here's a pond and this pond was actually behind our building. And the water level got so low that you could literally see the backs of some of the fish in the water. And because that water was so low, uh, the fish were super easy for those birds to find and hunt. Uh, so it was kind of like a feeding frenzy those last few days that the water was still there. Uh, so the low water conditions can actually help and be beneficial to hungry animals as well. Here you can see the uh, ground was so dry um, that the ground actually cracked 
And so when it's really dry, the soil can shrink or contract. And even though it looks like it's a bad thing, um, those cracks actually create good uh, hiding spots or shelters for things like little toads and spiders. Oftentimes, um, I'll go walking back there and I'll find little organisms hiding in the little cracks and crevices. And then obviously we know a lot of our fish died. Again, we saw dozens of uh, fish skeletons as well as crawfish skeletons. Uh, so fish weren't the only things that died as a result of water loss. Um, and here's an interesting little mark. This dark line right here is the old water line. So at one point, the pond water came all the way up here. And over time, you can see how much water has evaporated. Um, and that what, this is what was left. Um, over a certain amount of time. Eventually though, if we don't get any rain, that pond will probably uh, disappear completely. And um, I decided to go ahead and do a quick little experiment to see just how fast that water was evaporating. So over a course of a week, I just went outside and placed um, some markers every day. And notice between this marker and this marker, uh, that day had the most evaporation that day. And it was probably because that day was well up to 80 degrees, so it was rather warm that day, uh, thereby increasing the rate of evaporation uh, compared to these other days where there wasn't as much water loss. So we know that the hotter it is, the more water is going to be evaporating. And then here's just an aerial view of some ponds and creeks near Hillsboro, Texas. Um, but it's interesting to note how parts of the creek bed are totally dry. And then you can see this one little area where there's like a little puddle of water and you can see some cattle in there uh, getting water from there or simply cooling off on this hot day. Um, so it's interesting to note how different areas of Texas are also being impacted by hot and dry conditions. And these creeks will eventually feed into uh, Navarro Mills Lake, Lake Aquila, and eventually the Brazos River. So if these creeks are feeling the effects of drought, how do you think those other bodies of water um, are also being impacted by drought as well? Now, keep in mind that video was from the Hillsboro area. So if we took a, lake, a look at our map over here of US drought conditions, Hillsboro is right here in this little orange spot and they are actually under a severe drought right now. Um, and so farmers there are having a really hard time uh, with caring for their crops because there's not a lot of water and it's been so hot and dry lately. Now here in Dallas where we are, which is right over here, uh, Dallas right now is under a moderate drought. And then compare our area of Texas to the rest of Texas. So remember that tumbleweed I was showing you guys? I got that from West Texas during spring break. And parts of West Texas are actually under an extreme drought or exceptional drought. Uh, so some parts of Texas are really hurting um, from the effects of drought. And then in our next slide, uh, we're just going to briefly talk about some of the causes of drought. So think about what are some causes of drought that you can think of. And I'm going to go ahead and talk right into those. Um, so there are natural causes of drought. So sometimes it just happens and it's totally normal. And that is due to changes in the water cycle. So the water cycle and normal weather conditions can change wind patterns, clouds, and moisture, uh, which can cause a place to receive uh, not as much rain as it typically would. And again, it can be totally normal. Uh, um, other things that can cause drought would be climate change, which we've been hearing a lot about. Uh, climate change is being uh, worsened because of human actions. Uh, so climate change can, ca uh, can cause places around the world. Uh, to get hotter. And of course, we know that when it gets hotter outside, that rate of evaporation is going to increase. Uh, so we're going to start to lose more water. But also due to climate change, some areas will just receive less rain or precipitation. Also, overuse of water. So if we use more water faster than it can be replenished, we're also going to increase uh, the negative effects of drought. Um, so for example, if we take a look over here at this map, uh, this is the Ogallala Aquifer, and an aquifer is simply an underground layer of water-bearing rock, and it's a source of um, ground water. Now, the Ogallala Aquifer is actually super important for us here in the U.S., even here in Texas, uh, because it's used for irrigation of our crops. And so you can see by looking at this diagram and looking at the key, uh, we can understand and make inferences 
that these areas that are in red and orange, they are experiencing big declines in the amount in their water levels of groundwater. And that's because we are using water faster than it can be replenished. So if we keep going that rate, eventually there's not going to be any water there available for us to use. And then um, kind of on a bigger scale, uh, this little story fascinated me. Uh, so if you take a look at this diet, at this picture, what do you think this brown strip used to be? So I was watching this interesting documentary on um, avocados and its impact on the environment. And I love avocados. Uh, so that's why I guess I really like this this documentary that I was watching, um, but it was about uh, avocados being grown in a region of Chile called Petorca. And essentially there were so many avocado plantations there that they essentially used up all the water in this river basin and it totally ran dry. So that used to be a place where the river actually flowed through this town. And you can see that it is totally dry now. And that is because they were overusing that water resource uh, for these avocado plantations. Uh, so now not only do the avocado plantations not have water, but also the people, the communities living there don't have water either. Uh, so now they are forced to dig deep into uh, the groundwater to access uh, the water available in the ground. Uh, but again, that's just another effect of overusing our water resources. And then in our next slide, we're going to talk about how exactly does that drought affect our plants and animals. So if you take a look at some of these pictures, you can make some good inferences on how these animals and organisms are impacted by drought. Uh, so obviously, the most obvious one would be organisms would die. So things like fish, you can't walk and move away, uh, will perish because they don't have a water resource uh, to live out of. Uh, we talked about our crops earlier. People are impacted by drought as well. Um, and affects our food source. So we need crops to eat and for resources like cotton. Now, luckily, there are some animals that will stick it through drought and uh, they actually have adaptations that allow them to survive through those harsh time periods. Uh, so there's something called estivation and estivation is like a summertime uh, sleep. So we know hibernation takes place during the wintertime. It's estivation when it's taking place during the summertime when it's hot and dry. And usually our amphibians go through that. So things like toads and frogs, they will actually create a hole or a burrow and they can stay in that burrow until there's a rainfall or it's moist enough for them to come back out. Uh, there's also a fascinating animal called the African lungfish. It also creates a burrow um, and it stays in that burrow and it secretes the slime all over its body to help it maintain its moisture. And it can stay in that burrow for over five years until there's adequate rainfall. Uh, so some animals are able to survive through these harsh drought periods. And then uh, some benefits. There's actually some benefits of drought. So we always talk about the negative, but there are some positives to drought. Uh, the first is some organisms actually thrive through it and mostly it's going to be our insect friends. Uh, so especially our grasshoppers, they thrive during dr uh, drought because they feed on all that dead vegetation. But also a lot of the fungal diseases that typically would uh, harm grasshoppers, those fungal diseases aren't able to thrive when it's so hot and dry. So fungus needs moist environments and if it's hot and dry, that fungus is not going to survive. Uh, so that's a plus for the grasshoppers because they're not likely to get ill from fungal infections. Um, also, it, drought can also cause succession and that's just an ecological change. So when an ecosystem changes, new organisms can actually come in. So we take a look at this diagram. We have um, a pond and over a period of drought, it gets super hot and dry. The water evaporates. Eventually that pond is nothing but dirt eventually plants can start growing and moving in and we might end up having later on maybe a little meadow or grassland um, and with that grassland moving in other land animals can also move in so sometimes change is good and then my last little thing is a quick little challenge for you guys uh, to explore the process of evaporation uh, so again that water evaporation and water loss is a big component of drought uh, so something you guys can do is just take a cup of water and a piece of chalk, dump that cup of water on the sidewalk or the pavement, and then take your chalk and trace around your puddle. 
and then observe that puddle about every 30 minutes or every hour and see how it changes in size. And it's interesting to compare the rate of evaporation on say a hot sunny day versus a cooler shady or cloudy day. And then I also have a reflection question for you guys. Uh, since Dallas is in a uh, drought time right now, think of what are three things you can do to conserve water. So I know you might think, well, I'm just a student, but there are some small things that you can do on your end to help conserve water uh, when we are in times of drought. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop our screen share and we're gonna give it back to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. Question came in earlier from Solar Prep, a student named Poppy. And what is the bullfrog's name in Mr. Monroe's program? And his name is Hoppy. Okay. Now I'm going to share my screen. During this virtual field trip, students investigated the flow of energy and food chain and predicted how changes in food chain affect the ecosystem. Students also investigated environmental changes such as floods and droughts where some organisms thrive and others perish or move to new locations. Ms. Nash covered removal of bees Mr. Monroe told you what would happen if we didn't have any more frogs. Ms. Fuller discussed floods and Ms. Ramirez just did droughts. Thank you, teachers, how did we do? If you would go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback and fill out a very short form and send it back to us. We want to thank you guys for joining us today. We want to hope that you have a great rest of the day but more importantly, we want you to have a great rest of your life. Thank you again for joining.